Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Catholicism. Today, I'm here with my good friend, Joe Schmidt, to talk about how to be published as an undergrad. And of course, the audience of the episode today is primarily undergraduate students, but also just for people who want to know like how to write a good philosophy paper, how to you know get your voice out there and really meet the standards of academic rigor. And so I can say for a fact, you know, this, co this comment really made me laugh. It's from Kyle Myers with the FPS Russia profile picture. He says, you just got to have an IQ of 130 plus. Um, well, I don't know about my, I don't know about you, Joe, or myself, but I think it's safe to say that um, I think it takes a lot, a lot of hard work and just being committed with it. And so I don't want anyone to feel intimidated. And that's the whole point of the episode to make to let people know they can do philosophy as well. So, Joe, how are you doing? I am doing fine. I'm excited to be here and I'm excited to talk about this because it's, it's a fun topic. All right. Yeah. So, Joe, can you talk about um, the two books that you have published uh, right now? Yeah. So my first book, which is I published way back in, I think, either 2019 or 2020. I kind of forget. But uh, and I practiced pointing the right direction before this. <laughs> I better get it right this time. Ah, I got it right. Okay. So, yes, that's yeah, the first yeah. one is called um, The Majesty of Reason, A Short Guide to Critical Thinking and Philosophy. I start off talking about the methods and skills of critical thinking, as well as different intellectual and even moral virtues that you need to cultivate in order to engage in discussions of these sorts. And then I go into, you know, logic and critical thinking and how to do philosophy. And then we look at different case studies in there, uh, like applying the methods and skills and tools to scientism and the laws of nature and other sorts of debates. So that's the first book. And then the second book was just published. It's the publication year is 2023. It is right here, mm -hmm. Existential Inertia and Classical Theistic mm -hmm. Proofs, published with Springer and co-authored with, with Dr. Daniel J. Linford. Uh, we basically have three main goals in the book. The first one is to critically assess various classical theistic arguments for God's existence. So uh, arguments from people like Edward Fazer, Gavin Kerr, or Kerr, lots of others, Aquinas' Dante argument, Aquinas' first way. So that's the first goal. The second goal is to give the first book length treatment of the thesis of existential inertia, which is roughly the thesis that at least some temporal concrete things persist without being continuously sustained from outside of themselves. And then the third project was to look at some new arguments uh, pertaining to classical theism. So we looked at divine temporality and um, like theistic conceptualism and things like that. So yeah, that's the that's the the three main aims of the book, and yeah. And Joe, how many papers do you have published uh, right now? Yeah, so right now, so fully published, it's nine right now, but mm -hmm. uh, fingers crossed, I've, I've had a lot under review for the past months and the review <laughs> process, it takes so long. That's one thing that's so annoying about philosophy. It just, it takes so yeah. long. But uh, so fingers crossed in the new year, I, and hopefully coming up soon, I'll have, I'll have some more. Yeah, so Joe, tell me about... um. You know, well, actually, before we go on, I just wanted to mention, too, that um, I have two papers published. So one paper, well, I don't, I don't know if you really count the first one, but it's uh, with Cornell University's uh, Logos Undergraduate Journal. Mm -hmm. So I had that one published and I won third place in their prize. And that was during my freshman year in college. And then the other paper I have published is a defense of Vatican I Papal Theology in the Haythrop Journal um, in response to Jerry Walls. And so that one's kind of like the the big boy publication, if you know what I mean. Um, so there's that one. And then, you know, um, I think I'm finally ready to write a book on a lot of the research I've been doing on the papacy. Yes. So, I'm very excited. That's awesome. Yeah. And so, you know, I'll, I'll be, men I'll be talking about that further down the line, but I just want to tease it out right now. I can't I'm, wait. Like I'm actually talking, well, I'm, I'm, I'm working on talking to a publisher and I have some friends who are helping me out. And so it's really, I think this is the attempt that I'm going to make to really get it down in, in print. Awesome. Um, well, Joe, so I guess I think the first thing that people are going to wonder about is, you know, how, how do you get a paper published? What hoops and, you know, um, do you have to go through in order to get a paper published? What's the process? Yeah. So step one, you have to sell your soul. Step two. <laughs> no. um, yeah. So, I mean, the whole process, it's a long process, right? So um, you have the process before writing the paper. You have the process of writing the paper. You have the process of submitting the paper, and then you have the post-submission process. So we could probably go through each of those in turn. So before writing the paper, you basically have to have an idea, right? You need to have an idea of what you're doing, what you want to write on, and things like that. 
how do you get ideas? Well, you read, you read philosophy, you read papers, you read books, you talk to people on internet forums, you watch YouTube videos, you watch intellectual Catholicism, you watch Majesty of Reason, uh, <laughs> you immediately subscribe to them and turn on the notifications. Uh, you discuss these matters with your classmates, with your professors uh, in, in office hours. You discuss it with uh, maybe in emails with professional philosophers. You think hard about these things. You reflect on them. And yeah, that, that, that's how you sort of generate ideas. Another way to generate ideas is to go to various journals like within your topic of interest. So let's say mm -hmm. you're interested in philosophy of religion. Then you could go to the International Journal for Philosophy of Religion or Religious Studies or Faith and Philosophy. Those are the three kind of biggest philosophy of religion journals and you can look at some of their recent publications look at some of the stuff that's going on in the field and you can read those papers and if you've got a response to them that's another idea right so another idea is to respond to papers that have recently been published and the basic idea for your um for your ideas here at this stage before writing is you want them to be first cutting edge so they need to be kind of at the edge of research they'd be doing like newish research so they need to contribute to human knowledge in some way Secondly, they need to be relevant. So they need to be relevant to philosophy, relevant to the field. Like, why are you researching this? And why does it matter? Mm -hmm. Thirdly, it needs to be significant, right? So it's not like um, you can't write a paper saying, um, Joe, on page 10 of this paper, spelled uh, perspicacious incorrectly. Uh, that, that's yeah. not significant. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that is not significant. It needs to be a significant idea. So like, hey, here's a new argument for the papacy. Or, hey, here's a new objection to this popular argument. Or... Uh, you know, these sorts of things. Or here's a new assumption that, that we've all overlooked in debates about internalism versus externalism or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be significant. It needs to, like I said, advance the discussion. So it needs to take us beyond what we have so far. And it needs to be publishable. So the idea needs to be publishable. And I guess publishability is kind of a mixture of all those together with the packaging of it, right? The way that you write and the way that you engage with the pre-existent literature. So that's before writing, you need to have the idea. It's a right. lot of, it's, I mean, it's difficult, right? But uh, mm -hmm. you need to have the idea. Before writing, you also need to have an outline, or at least I think you should probably get an outline. That's the, the best thing to do. So what does an outline do? Well, uh, kind of wears on its sleeve what it does. It outlines your paper. Uh, so, you know, you have like the introduction, you'll say, um, you know, you'll situate the topic. Um, you'll give some citations about recent literature. You'll talk about why this is significant, all very brief and concise. And then you'll give an outline, You within your outline, uh, you should write that you're going to outline the, the rest of the structure of your paper. Right. Uh, and then you go into the next section, which is like, let's say you're developing the argument. Then the next section, let's say you're uh, responding to objections. And then uh, the final section, you might point out avenues for new research, and then you conclude or whatever. And so, yeah, your outline, that is super duper important. Um, and yeah, so you need to make an outline. You also need to do research, right? So that's another huge topic. And that's impossible. Again, no, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is before writing as well. So like I suggest before writing, you need to do some research. You need to, um, need to look up papers, look up books on the relevant topic. Uh, you can search key terms, you can search for papers, you can search for these sorts of things in various philosophy databases. So things like philpapers.org, things like Google Scholar, things like academia.edu, things like JSTOR. Um, you can also ask researchers in the area for relevant books or articles. That is a very, very good thing because like, if you're new to this sort of stuff, if you're an undergrad, you're new to this stuff, right? So um, you're not gonna be aware of the most relevant research. I mean, of course, you're gonna get a good glimpse if you research or if you search key terms and papers of what I just mentioned, but you should talk to some researchers who are in this area, maybe email them or just message them on Facebook. Be like, yeah. hey, I wanna, yeah, go, go on. Well, I wanted to add that, you know, a lot of people are, you know, ask me on the channel, like Swan, how do you get in touch with all these philosophers and thinkers? And you'd be surprised how if you just email them, they're very willing to respond, you know, as long as your email is to the point and not like insulting them or crazy, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like the other day, you know, like having I had an email correspondence with Richard Swinburne and for a lot of people that's like crazy. But no, I mean, he's really willing to kind of respond and share his opinions and things like that. So a lot of these people are really eager to help you. Absolutely. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. a that's a great addition. Um, it's intimidating at first, right? Because these are like yeah. seasoned scholars in the field. But yeah, I've also found that for the most part, when you reach out to them, they're they're very willing to help. So it's, it's wonderful. So yeah, ask researchers in the area for like relevant books or articles. Be like, I have this idea. Do you think this is publishable? What ways could I, could I proceed forward? What like books and articles should I read or like chapters, uh, things like that. Research widely as well. So um, yeah, definitely research widely. Don't just do it super duper narrowly. Um, I guess 
another thing to do is when you find a paper of interest, go look at its references, right? Go look mm -hmm. at its references, find the references in there and see what it's researching and keep on doing that for different articles. A good place to start as well that I, that I forgot to mention on a topic is if you want like an overview, go to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy or go to the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Those are very good. Uh, they give very good overviews of various topics and arguments in philosophy. So those are very good as well. And they give you resources at the end. Philosophy Compass is also a journal that publishes like reasonably accessible introductions to topics as well. Um, and then as you're gathering these papers, what I do is I like I have like you need organization, right? So you need you need to put them all in a document or something like that. Um, usually what I do is I gather a bunch of resources first and then I put them in the document. Uh, and then I go through them. I'll take notes on some of them. Some of them will be more salient than others. I'll like mark which ones are more salient. I'll try to like demarcate them into different branches. So like this one is about the first premise of my argument. So I, mm -hmm. I lump all those resources together. These resources are about the second premise of my argument. So I'm gonna lump all those together. Uh, and then, yeah, you just systematically proceed through them. It takes a while, but you know, read through them, take notes where appropriate. Um, and to get a glimpse of them, right? You read the abstract and that'll usually give you a sense of whether or not it's gonna be relevant to, to your paper. Um, and you don't always have to read the full paper. It might just be a section that's relevant, et cetera. So anyway, that's the research portion. And sometimes that's intermingled. Like I usually do the research intermingled with the outline, you know, like in my outline, I'd be like, oh, I need to engage with such and such paper here. And I'll like note that in my outline. So like these two, the, the research and the outline are kind of fluid uh, with one another. Um, sometimes I do the research first and then do the outline. Sometimes I do the outline first and then I do the research. Sometimes they're intermingled. Uh, it really all just depends. So that's all before writing yeah right <laughs> so yeah. that kind of concludes the, the the section that's before writing um then there's the writing process itself the good thing is is that if, if you have a good outline the paper writes itself so that's that's the best thing about the outline i mean if if you do the outline the paper will write itself uh I mean, especially, especially the way that I like to do outlines, you know, like I have my main argument there and I just, I basically like my paragraphs correspond to yes. points in the outline. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I'll be like, um, I'll have like objection and then I'll just do like a, my own Joe speak, you know, like a premise one is allegedly question begging. And then uh, under that, I'll be like three responses, premise one, no, it's independently justified. Premise two, no, this rests on an equivocation in three. And, and so like each of those corresponds to a paragraph of itself. Uh, so it's like super duper easy once you have a good outline to just make paragraphs based on that. And it's super duper helpful because you did like, you front loaded your thinking, right? So now you're just kind of just trying to put it into words. So yeah, um, using your outline when you're writing is, is very good. Uh, what characteristics should your writing have? First, I mean, it should be really well structured. So philosophers love to signpost. Uh, it's wonderful. Signposting is basically walking your reader step by step, taking them, taking their hand and holding them and walking them through your paper. Uh, it sounds weird uh, when people are just getting <laughs> started when they, we're just starting into philosophy, you know, it can be weird. They're like, okay, so now I'm going to argue for this premise. Yeah. And then they argue for it and then like, okay, so I just finished arguing for the premise. Now I'm going to consider an objection. <laughs> like it sounds so weird to like the people who are like into like literature and things like that. Like this is not mm -hmm. how you write, but yes, in philosophy, that is how you write. Uh, yeah. So, uh, well, you I, know, Joe, yeah, and I, I would just want to add here too, that I think sometimes like when you're writing a paper, you kind of think like, oh, well, I don't have to explicitly make this point, you know, clear because it's kind of obvious, right? It's implied. And it's like, no, your reader is going to yeah. probably miss it. You know, <laughs> yeah. my, my philosophy instructor who helped me uh, become a better writer, he said in the beginning of class, and this was like the mantra of every single class, your reader is an idiot. Yes. That's how you have to write. <laughs> not just an idiot, not just an idiot. They are, so I've been told that, but also they are mean, lazy, and stupid, right? So they're mean <laughs> as well. They're going to interpret you as uncharitably as possible, right? So right, think right. about this. If you have this in mind, you're thinking them as mean, lazy, and uh, dang it, I forgot. Oh, stupid, mean, lazy, and stupid. Yeah. So if they're mean, they're going to interpret everything you say. If it's ambiguous, they're going to interpret it in the, in the worst way. Uncharitable, yeah, the worst way, mm -hmm. the uncharitable one. So you have to be constantly on the lookout for that. They are lazy, right? So that means they're not going to do the these implicit inferences. You exactly. think it's it obviously follows from this that that be no kind of spell it out for them, right? Because they're lazy, right? And they're also stupid, right? <laughs> so they don't <laughs> see that. Um, we're talking about a hypothetical reader, and this is how you write philosophy. You write philosophy as if your reader is mean, lazy, and stupid. So that that's an excellent point. Yes. So uh, it needs to be. I think um, one of my uh, professors at Purdue, who was, uh, he's outstanding, does medieval philosophy, his name is um, Jeff Brower. And mm -hmm. he, he called this kind of philosophy, 
and it's what drew him to like interest being interested in like medieval philosophy because they have like a kind of quasi analytic philosophy you know it's it's he called it i think beal philosophy because it's like just the skeleton or something i, I don't know he called it something mm -hmm. like that it was funny but yeah it, it's like you give you, the signposting is you're telling your reader where you're going i'm now giving an argument here's the argument here's the first premise here's the second premise here's the third premise there are three objections here's the first objection here's the, my response here's the second objection yeah. <laughs> it's very methodical it's very um structured uh, and you signpost. You tell them what you're doing. Uh, so yeah, structure and signposts. Those are big and mean, lazy, and stupid. Your reader. Okay. Another characteristic of your writing is that it has to be very clear, right? That that has that has to do with the mean, lazy, and stupid thing. But just be clear. There might be ambiguities. Uh, try to remove the ambiguities. Try to be clear. Also, try to be um, precise, right? So, mm -hmm. in addition to being clear, try to be precise in your speech. Try to really pinpoint what you are saying and say it with the requisite precision. Uh, another characteristic of your writing is that, well, this, this one kind of varies by topic, but like rigor is usually expected in philosophy. So like you're generally expected to um, like give an argument and, you know, formalize it, make sure that it's valid, you know, make sure that the conclusion follows from the premises. You're not just giving a kind of informal, you know, diatribe or uh, like stream of consciousness sort yeah. of thing, but, uh, you're showing the systematic connections between ideas and that requires you to be rigorous. It requires you to roll up your sleeves and show that, Hey, that conclusion does follow from those premises. And so that, that takes a kind of rigor. Uh, so you need to understand some, some logic before you, um, at least, you know, just kind of basic deductive logic, you know, like if a, then b, mm -hmm. a, therefore b, those sorts of things. Um, and the various inference rules. So yeah, that's also very important. Uh, also important is concision. So mm -hmm. being concise. And what I mean by that is I don't mean a short paper. Oftentimes, like you, in order to go to town on a topic, you have to write a long paper. You have to address all the objections. You have to address, uh, you have to define your terms if you do that. So I'm, when I say concise, I don't mean brief. I mean appropriately brief, right? It has to be appropriate for uh, the task at hand. Um, and what it also means is that don't include all this fluff. Like, oh, ever since the dawn of time, humanity yeah. has, has pondered <laughs> the question of God's existence. And uh, you know, uh, do not, do not write yeah. like that. Cut Never. it out. Mm -hmm. Like, if an editor sees that, you are getting a desk rejection. What that means is that mm -hmm. they are not even going to send it out for review. You're going to hear back a few days after you submitted it saying, I mean, they're not going to tell you why, but that's going to be why they're mm -hmm. going to reject it. So uh, do not write with fluff. Um, that is the most annoying thing. When I see that, I roll my eyes and I click away from the screen. I, I immediately do not read the paper. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, another thing, another characteristic of your writing is that it needs to be scholarly. What does that mean? It means no insults. It means no, um, no chest thumping. It means, uh, you know, be cautious with your words in yeah. general. Like when you, again, if your reader is mean, lazy, and stupid, like assume that they disagree with you. So you generally want to stay of stay away from saying like if you reject this conclusion, you're irrational, or I have demonstrably proved this thing. Because mm -hmm. you need to assume that the reviewers, in order for your paper to get accepted, <laughs> right, needs to go through the reviewers, and they're probably going to send it to people who disagree with you. So firstly, just as a matter of practicality. Secondly, you probably shouldn't be that confident in your conclusions. And thirdly, um, yeah, it's just more welcoming. It's more scholarly uh, if you don't have like these sorts of. Uh, triumphalistic words yeah like absolutely destroy or yeah. something oh, like yeah. that definitely yeah. don't say mm -hmm. debunk don't say destroy yeah. don't say i mean i would even advise staying away from like you know colorful adjectives like demonstrable and things like mm -hmm. that and like proof and uh refute um yeah you know just say in the terms of like here's my argument like don't say proof or here's my objection instead of here's my refutation of your proof you know um so just be cautious with your words, be scholarly, no insults, none of that, no chest something, no triumphalism, et cetera. Um, and occasionally as you, as you get into the reins, as you start publishing more, you can add a little bit of flair, right? So um, that's something that I really like about philosophy is that once you start getting into the grip of things, once you've you know, got down the basics, you can add occasional puns, you can add, it can add some jokes, you can add some lightheartedness <laughs> here and there. Um, you can add, uh, yeah, you can add things like that. And um, you can add fun stories. So like when you're doing thought experiments, right, you get to mm -hmm. kind of construct a thought experiment of yourself. You can be kind of creative. It's almost like creative writing. Um, I mean, again, don't make it super duper fluff. Like don't talk about the color of the shoelaces of the person, but you know, uh, you could still make it, make it reasonable. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's something that's fun about philosophy. So you can add flair, but just, uh, I, I would wait to do that until you're, you've got the, you know, you've got the grips on the, <laughs> how to, how to write these sorts of papers and publish. So um, that's characteristics of your writing. Mm -hmm.
You also have the writing process. That's going to look differently for different people. I'm not here to tell people uh, the best way to do their writing process. You might might want to do a Pomodoro technique, or you know, where you do like 25 minute blocks and you wait, and you just get like a five minute reward, and then you do 25 minutes. You might just try to do deep work, so you try to get that state of flow where you are mm -hmm. just you're just totally absorbed in your writing, maybe for like two hours on end, maybe three hours, even four hours. Um, uh, it just looks differently for different people, and uh, that that'll be individual specific. So yeah, the writing process. Uh, and again, like you're integrating, you're synthesizing all the stuff from your research, from your outline. You probably have multiple documents open. Um, yeah. So uh, also, once you've written your paper, this is super duper important. Get feedback. Get yeah. feedback. I'm going to say it a third time. Get feedback. So get feedback before you submit your paper. Um, it's just so important. So like if you're an undergrad, you you try to find a professor and ask you know professors are so busy but so mm -hmm. so it might be difficult but try to get a professor try to get someone to read your paper and give you feedback maybe um one of your peers maybe a grad student maybe someone online maybe a, a professor maybe just, just try to get someone who's in the know who knows about the topic and who is something like uh you know more in the field than you are try mm -hmm. to get them to give feedback before submission because Spoiler alert, there will be criticisms and problems with your paper of which you're unaware. There will yeah. be, okay? <laughs> there just will be. So uh, you need you need another pair of eyes, uh, perhaps multiple pairs of eyes. So that's that's just super duper important. And I mean, again, it's fine if you ask a peer, but like, again, if you really want to advance in philosophy, you need to be sending it to like a professor or a grad student or, you know, like people who are in the know. Um, so... Yeah, that's another that's another thing. Oh, and also, you know, like just standard writing conventions do not have your paper. I mean, again, you might have one or two spelling errors. That's fine. But like, you know, this is this is publishing business. Like you need to have a very good paper it needs to be polished, read through it multiple times before submission. Um, yeah, define your terms, etc. So that's the writing process. Um, any comments on that before we go to the submission stuff? Yeah, I mean, this is actually my favorite part is the writing process, because I really like part of my past work has been actually as an editor. And, you know, when I had to edit my own papers, I had a lot of fun. But like when you were talking about, for example, let's say concision, you know, my professor who taught me, he said, basically, let paragraphs do paragraph size jobs and let sentences do sentence size jobs. Right. So sometimes you're trying to write a sentence and you have too many contractions and ands and yet and buts. <laughs> yeah. Right. And then and then what happens is that the reader gets lost in the sea of just this one sentence, you know. And so, like, you know, every paragraph has to have meaning it has to be justified why you have this paragraph here why this sentence is there right you can't just you know have a paragraph well you know sometimes okay usually you don't want to do like asides or like just random kind of off topic things i probably say never do that unless it's somehow kind of relevant mm -hmm. right but that's risky you know it's really good if you just stick right to the point and get to the argument the meat and bones and mm -hmm. you know all that that you need for it yeah um, and then regarding feedback i'll just say that you know, it's really surprising when you go through um, having someone look over your paper because then you'll, they'll see things that you could not have possibly seen on your own. Uh -huh. um, and other times, too, like you need to take a step back and maybe give yourself like a day before you look at your paper again. And then all of a sudden things will jump out at you that you didn't see before. Yeah. Um, well, Joe, and I mean, we could talk about the reviewers. Um, <laughs> we'll get to uh, that. here or we can do that later. What we'll do you want to do? So I, I just want to build on what you just said for a sure. second. Uh, I was taking... No, it's quite vigorously over here because it, <laughs> you, you spawned some great ideas. So that was really good. So firstly, with respect to sentences, when in doubt, break it up. Okay, when in doubt, yeah. break it up. That's what I say. Uh, when I look at many undergrad essays and so on, oh man, it's like fragments upon fragments upon, it, it, it's either <laughs> fragment. no, it's sorry. I said fragment, it's run-ons. It's run-ons upon run-ons yeah. upon run-ons. These run-on sentences were like, and, but, and things like, it's like you lose track of what's going on. So when in doubt, break it up. Uh, just It's fine to have simple sentences. It's fine to be like, here's the first objection. That's a perfectly fine sentence. You don't say, here's the first objection, and you know, you just say something about like, no, it's a perfectly fine sentence. So like, when in doubt, mm -hmm. break it up. That's fine. As for paragraph structure, yeah, I mean, generally try to have your paragraphs be on like one main topic. So that'll usually be the first sentence of your paragraph beyond like right. the main topic of that, and then try to flesh it out, and then maybe mm -hmm. a concluding sentence for that paragraph, uh, which is kind of like, either bridging into the next paragraph or kind of summing up or maybe both summing up what you just said in that paragraph, et cetera. So um, that's not a hard and fast rule that can sometimes, I mean, that can very often be broken. You'll get a, 
you'll get a grip as to when it should or shouldn't be broken as you write more, et cetera, and as you read more. Um, that's another thing. Uh, take like mental notes when you're reading these papers and reading these books of other professional philosophers. Kind of take me mental notes about how they write, what mm -hmm. goes in their footnotes, um, like what seems to be footnote worthy versus what seems to be main paragraph worthy, what terms they're defining, how they structure their papers, how they reference others, how they construct arguments, like really pay attention to that. When you do that, it, it'll just sort of kind of like through osmosis, like go into your own mind and you will under, you'll, you'll sort of get a grip as to how to write papers better. So like kind of like when you're reading these papers, don't just focus on their content, but also focus on their structure, their form, their, uh, all these other features, because that can proactively influence you. Another point. Uh, two more points briefly before we go on to the submission process mm -hmm. um, is on footnotes. So uh, footnotes, generally try to minimize them, try, generally try to make them short. They're totally fine, though, to include. Oftentimes, you need them for citations. So in your main text, oftentimes, you, you have a kind of flow. You've got a flow paragraph. It looks nice. And you just if you dumped in like 12 citations at one point, yeah. it completely breaks up the, the flow of the paragraph. So sometimes you need to do that in a footnote. You need to show that you're aware of this literature. And um, you're like, hey, um, I'm assuming here... Uh, this view about uh, the essentiality of origins. Uh, this view is defended in X, but there are some detractors and they are X, Y, and Z. Uh, for mm -hmm. a response to detractors, C, W. Uh, like that's a perfectly good footnote, right? It shows that you're aware of the literature, you're making or pointing out an assumption that you just made, and you're showing that like, listen, I recognize that that's an assumption and I'm not going to defend it. If you want to look at other places, here are some places. So like, know what's good for a footnote. And uh, again, generally try to minimize them, but uh, they're there for when like you suspect that a slightly irrelevant thing might come up in a reviewer's mind. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like that's, that's what happens to me so much. It's like, there's this objection, which I know is kind of dumb, but like, I know that someone's going to bring it up. So I'm like, okay, you go on a footnote. Uh, mm -hmm. So like someone, you know, someone might object at this juncture that P, but that of course rests on an equivocation. Uh, and so then you, you spell that out. So um, yeah, footnotes are generally for things like references for flagging assumptions for, um, responding to like slightly irrelevant or kind of slightly stupid objections that you suspect will come up in the reviewer's minds, uh, those sorts of things. Um, and sometimes for like clarifications uh, or like reminding someone like, hey, I argued for this, this claim earlier on. So if, if you forget that, which you know, you're liable to do because you're mean, lazy, and stupid, so like, just see that, that first section. So like those sorts of things. Okay, that's footnotes. Again, John, we're trying to minimize them. And I would, I would very strongly recommend not having a footnote that is more than one paragraph, more than one normal paragraph. Right. You sometimes see footnotes and they go on for like four paragraphs. And it's like, dude, I'll just put it in the main text or take it out. That is not for a footnote. Okay. So I would, I would limit them to one paragraph uh, generally. Again, sometimes there will be exceptions, but that's very rare. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and then finally, the final thing is patience, right? Be patient with yourself, with the writing process. Everyone's different. Um, it might be disheartening, you know, when you're looking around, you're seeing grad students and professional philosophers publish and so on. Um, but it's, you know, just patience. Just be patient, okay? This is a process. You're growing. You're learning. Uh, don't be too hard on yourself. Patience is key. Patience with yourself. Patience with others. If you're getting their feedback, mm -hmm. they are helping you. They are going out of your way. They are going out of their way to help you. They have so much on their plate. You need to be patient with them. You need to be patient with yourself. Uh, you need to be thankful to them. Uh, you need to, like, all those sorts of things. So patience is key in, in philosophy. Like you said, like, take a day off after you wrote, like, your paper because it'll give you, like, a fresh perspective a few days later. It's so, like, try not to rush this. I am very prone to rushing. As you can see, as you can see when I'm talking, I'm very animated. I am very, I rush everything. <laughs> I publish, I publish, like, um, blog posts very quickly. I publish uh, videos very quickly because uh, I'm just uh, hyper- I'm hyper. That, that's that's the term for me. Um, uh, sometimes I struggle sitting still, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, but patience. Patience is key, and I I try to work on that. Again, when I say when I give all these tips, I'm not you know proclaiming to be on a high horse that I'm like perfect at all these things. Like, no, this is a work in progress. I am a work in progress, right? Like, it's a seamless accent, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, I am a work in progress. I'm working on all these things as I'm telling them to you. I'm just trying to help you guys. I'm trying to help all of us. I'm trying to help me. Okay. So, um, yeah, just positive vibes here. Um, you know, because it's the internet, people, uh, are, we can assume that our, our, our viewers are mean, lazy, and stupid. No, they're, they're of course not. But if they were, they'd be like, oh, he, this kid thinks that he can give us advice, like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, that's, that's all for the writing process. Uh, we could probably move on to submission. Okay. So once you finish all that, you've gotten your feedback, you've, you've written in there, maybe you've sprinkled in a few puns or jokes, et cetera. <laughs> um, you, you're finally ready for submitting. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is a little bit tricky. <laughs> When you're when you're early on in your uh, in your publishing, 
ask ask the people who you got feedback from where you should submit this. Okay, they're, they're going to be they're going to be the most helpful. Okay, um, that's what I did with some of my early papers. I uh, Josh Rasmussen was like my main sort of mentor going through all that, and um, he was able to direct me to the relevant journals that would be best for my paper. Uh, so that's the that's the first thing that you should do. Like you should ask the people who you got feedback from who are like you know in the know, like the professors or the grad students. Where do you think this could go? Where is good? Um, and they'll be able to direct you. So yeah, the key thing is finding a journal that's appropriate for your article. The journal's website, so you know you can search up these sorts of things. Um, like, let's just take an example, IJPR, International Journal for Philosophy of Religion. Uh, the journal's website, you just search that up, it'll come up, it's, there's like a little Springer page for it. Uh, and the journal's website will have instructions on how to submit, where to submit, what to submit, mm -hmm. um, the, the format of it. Uh, it'll tell you how many keywords you need. It'll tell you, the size of the abstract that you should have. Yeah. It should tell you roughly the size of the paper. Um, and again, you should probably be thinking about this also when you're going in, like, okay, generally when you're writing philosophy papers, they're gonna be between like five and 10K usually um, for how many words they are. So like, keep that in mind. Uh, no one's gonna publish a 20K article. I can guarantee <laughs> that no one. Um, like the max, absolute max is usually 15. And that's only at some select journals where they allow you to go up to that. So like generally they max out at 10. Um, so yeah, just be aware of that. But also, like, look at the particular website uh, and the journal website to see all those instructions and the the things. They might also have certain like some journals are very lax. They're like, yeah, you don't really need too much formatting. Other ones are like this needs to be double spaced. If it's not double spaced, we're gonna send it right back to you, right. and you're gonna have to effing, effing double space it. That's basically what they tell you. Uh, <laughs> or you know, some of them are like, has to be Times New Roman, twelve point font, one inch yeah. margin. If you don't have that, you know, it's like. Some of them are very strict. Other ones are like, yeah, if it gets accepted, we'll tell you what to do. You know, so they mm -hmm. like kind of like let you. You can. Um, so again, just read through that uh, the the pages that the the journals that you're the prospective journals. Um, that's very very important. Uh, what are editors looking for? Uh, so editors are looking that they're they're looking for the following, or they're asking themselves. Is this article within the scope of our journal? Usually they'll have scope and aims on their journal website, right? So click on that. They're going to say, hey, this is for philosophy of religion. We publish mainly in philosophy of religion. And that includes, you know, they're going to specify some topics or whatever. Um, yeah, other ones are like a generalist journal. So they accept basically any area of philosophy. Um, and they have different scopes. So some of them are like highly technical. They're like logic journals. Um, there are other ones that are uh, like explicitly intended to be available, you know, like readable for like an undergrad audience. So like, again, read the aims and the scope as well as the instructions for the, the relevant journals. Um, so yeah, the editors, like I said, they're asking whether or not it's within the scope of the journal, like your paper. They're asking whether or not your paper advances the discussion, right? Because that's a super duper important thing. They're asking whether or not it's innovative, whether or not it's novel. Um, they're asking if it adds to an active research field. Like, so you might have a novel idea, but like this debate died out in like the 1940s. So like right. no one cares. <laughs> so so they're, 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 they're looking at, if you're adding to like an active field, that's where they're looking at a lot of your citations. So it's important to have like recent citations or, you know, like to show maybe in the introduction, like, hey, this has been talked about recently and, you know, give some citations of that. Um, they're gonna look at if you're like, basically if it's scholarly, if it's carefully prepared, if the sentences are nice, they're gonna read, maybe they're gonna skim it, they're gonna look at a few paragraphs, see if it's, see if you can write. Um, uh, they're gonna see if you follow the submission guidelines. They're gonna see if you were clear and use concise language. Um, yeah, so in general, again, to check if a journal is right for you, you're gonna wanna read the aims and the scope on the journal website. Um, consider if other researchers in the area would be interested in this topic. Um, see if the target journal accepts the type of manuscript you want to publish. Um, yeah. So th th those are a lot of the things for publishing or for, for submitting. Okay. So that's just the submission process. And then there's post submission. So do you have anything to say on the submission? Oh yeah, sure. I mean, I think the one thing is, you know, if you get rejected, don't take it personally. Oh yeah. Right. Oh. Because sometimes, you know, sometimes like they just have too many submissions and they just have to reject and it's nothing personal. Maybe your paper would have been another possible world been accepted, but not in the actual world, you know, yeah. in this time around. Um, yeah. The other thing, too, that um, I wasn't prepared for, but then I was like, no, I should have known that this was going to happen, was let's say like, you know, um, one journal, well, you know, you want to submit, generally speaking, one journal at a time. Oh, yeah, then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. that's it. Sorry, I, that's yeah. something that I definitely had to <laughs> emphasize. So I, I yeah. just, I have to, I have to step in here. Uh, yeah, 
do not multi-submit. Do not yeah. submit like waving my hands in the air. Do not submit to multiple journals. Do not submit your single paper to multiple journals. Obviously, you can have yeah. different papers at different journals, but <laughs> do not. Do not submit a single paper to multiple journals. That is explicitly forbidden, and it's it's not good. Yeah. And they usually say that on the instructions, but yeah, do not do that. Um, also, do not uh, do not self plagiarize. So do not take stuff that you have published in the past. Yeah. So if it's in published, like obviously you could take papers that you've written for your professor is in published though. That's fine. Um, uh, and like you know, obviously like you can take stuff from your own blog post or things like that. But like mm -hmm. if you have published it in like a journal or a book or you know some published setting, some official published thing. That is self plagiarism. That is not okay. Um, don't plagiarize in general, of course, as well, right? So if right. you're paraphrasing, say that you like cite the person that you're paraphrasing. If you are quoting, put it in quotes and cite it, etc. Okay, that thing, that stuff is self evident, but you know, you'd be surprised how much <laughs> how much of that goes on. Um, so yeah, okay, go on. I interrupted you. Yeah, well, you know, and bouncing off that just really quick, you know, as soon as you have the paper published, it's not really your baby alone anymore. Right. It belongs to the publisher in a way. And so you have to respect copyright and or, you know, there's other things that go on with the legalities of that. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I wanted to mention was, you know, when I had a paper rejected, let's say from one journal and let's say the requirement was MLA citation or APA citation. And then I have to go to another journal that says Chicago. Then I have to go back to the paper, change the, or, or, or it's like, we want parenthetical citations, right? <laughs> and then you put it all in the bibliography. It's like, ah, no footnotes or something, you know? So you have to get ready to do that really annoying restructuring, but that's just part of the game, you know? Yeah, that um, is, oh, that is so painful. <laughs> so yeah, so EJPR, the European Journal for Philosophy of Religion, um, I published a paper in there that actually became one of the chapters of uh, my existential inertia and classical theistic proofs book. It's on the Neoplatonic proof from Phaser, uh, and yeah, so I they they had one of those they had one of the nice submission processes where um, you know they basically told you some guidelines, but they're like you know if it gets accepted later on in the process, you'll have to follow our strict things. But like for submission, it's fine. Like you can have MLA, APA, those sorts of things. So you know I did it in my normal. You know, like um, I'd cite Schaffer 2009 or something, you know, in the main mm -hmm. text. And then in the bibliography, I'd have the full details. But for e the, the official thing, it's like they have that format where you cite the whole, all the details in the footnote. <laughs> you, like, you know that, you know, I don't know what, what yeah. format it is, but like you have to give like the volume number, the journal and everything yep. in the footnote or like whatever. It's insane. That is so, so I had to do all, it was so annoying. Uh and you know, I had like 30 citations in that one, maybe even 40, and it was like, oh, okay. Well, anyway, it was took up a lot of my time. That was so annoying. But anyway, okay. Um, so yeah, so that's the submission process. And now post submission. So so, what are you doing post submission? Okay, so <clears throat> so I mean, here's what happens on the other end, right? So it goes to like the the editors or whatever of the journal. They look at it. They they look at those things that I was just mentioning. They're going to decide, is this a good fit for our journal? Is it advancing the field? Is it an active field? Is this, does it look like a good paper or like on, on its face? If so, we'll send it out for review. So mm -hmm. then what they do is they get um, two professional philosophers in the field who generally it's people who like actively publish on these topics. Most often it's going to be people who are not sympathetic to your paper, or at least you can expect that. Um, and yeah, so they send it out. It's generally going to be two people who they send it out to generally. Rare occasions, it'll be one. Um, like if they very, if they very strongly trust someone to do that. So, like for instance, uh, well, anyway, I, I won't get names. Um, sometimes it's three. Uh, sometimes it might, might very rarely, it might even be four. Um, <laughs> but generally, it's two. And then those guys are basically the the reviewers. They they read through the paper and then they write up a referee report and they give a verdict. They either say it's going to be rejected, just you know, we're not going to give you any resubmission chances, or they say revise and resubmit. So that does not mean that they are committing to publishing it later on. It just means you revise it and you resubmit it. And we're going to look at it again. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's just what it means. Um, sometimes those get accepted later on. Sometimes they don't. It varies. So that can also be broken down into a major revision and a minor revision. Mm -hmm. A minor revision, you can be pretty happy about that. Okay. Because a minor revision generally means that the reviewers that they send it out to, they generally liked it. They have some reservations that you should address, but the editors and the reviewers think that it's, you know, sufficiently minor that you'll probably be able to do it and it'll probably get published. It's no guarantee, but it'll probably be done. If it's a major revision, then it's basically like as if you're submitting a new paper of sorts and it's, you know, 
they, they want you to do some significant uphaul or upheave or whatever on the paper. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, you're gonna have to address a lot of the objections that the reviewers had. You might have to reformat sections. Um, and uh, in general, this sucks, but in general, the reviewer is always right. What I mean by that is just like, it's like the customer is always right. Even if the customer <laughs> says one plus one equals five, <laughs> the customer is right. In general, you are to defer to the reviewer. Uh, now, sometimes that's just yeah. not possible because they are so overwhelmingly wrong. But uh, <laughs> in general, like as as you can, you have to be as conciliatory as possible in this. That's it's a game, uh, unfortunately. But yeah, in general, be very conciliatory as possible. So yeah, um, and, and again, it's advised to have like a mentor taking you through this process. When you get a revise and resubmit, like you have to prepare a response to reviewers. So like. You're gonna want to ask your advisor or whatever, whoever's helping you, to like, hey, how should I do this? Um, uh, or you can just message me, and I can send you a draft of a revise. You basically have like a title page which says like, thanks to the editors and the reviewers, um, I respond to reviewer one on these pages, and I respond to reviewer two on these pages. And you have to address each of their points. So anyway, um, yeah. So that's after after review, you get one of those decisions, and then yeah, another thing is prepare to wait. Again, patience is the name yeah. of the game here. So prepare to wait. You can sometimes wait. So, so it, generally, it's expected, you know, you're going to wait something like three months, okay? That's right. general. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've had, like, one or two papers where it was, like, within two weeks. It, like, yeah. they, the reviewers were on it. Like, wow, okay. Um, I've had other papers where it's, like, 16 months. So you're going to have to wait, right? So expect three months. That's That's the expectation. But, like, do not be surprised if it goes up to four or five or six or seven. Now, after like, you know, three or four, maybe four months, sometimes you can send an email to the editor and be like, hey, mm -hmm. it's been four months. Would you be able to give me an update? Uh, maybe the reviewers forgot about it. Uh, could you send them an email or something like that? Um, that is sometimes appropriate. Again, just generally ask, ask whoever your advisor is or ask people higher down or higher up in the field and ask them like, is this a good time to do that, et cetera. Uh, but like I said, be prepared to wait. Uh, reviewers, right? Like these are people who generally, they have families they have full-time jobs usually they are publishing themselves usually yeah. they serve on like editorial committees usually they are reviewers for like multiple papers at one time like reviewing your paper is not the top thing not their top priority um mm -hmm. and like for good measure right like they have a life they need they have to feed their children so <laughs> don't um, be a karen <laughs> yeah do not be a karen so um yeah generally expect to wait um that's that's the thing uh another thing so yeah, we covered, you're either going to get a reject and accept or rise and resubmit. Um, oh, another thing is, like I said, I mean, expect the reviewers to be, this isn't always the case, but I'd say like 65% of the time, the reviewer reports are so stupid. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> like this is, I mean, this is notorious for everyone, especially like reviewer number two, which yeah, they usually put like the, 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 the better reviewer number one or like the, the person who is more favorable to your paper. And then reviewer number two just rips it to shreds. Right. Um, sometimes they like really do rip it to shreds and it's good because they give like really good criticisms and you're like, ah, oh, crap. Like sometimes they totally refute your, your, like your thesis. Um, other times they just point out like systematic ambiguities and other sorts of problems. But like a, a majority of the time, not like a super vast majority of the time, but like a majority. So like, again, maybe like 60% of the time, just the dumbest stuff ever. Yeah. Like they're, they're raising like <laughs> random objections. They're like, oh, like you tell them at the beginning, I'm just going to assume this thesis and I'm drawing out some consequences of it. And these are significant consequences. Reviewer number two will say, well, that assumption is false. Like, ugh. like, dude, I am just drawing out consequences from it. Okay. It's irrelevant to say that the assumption is false. I'm just right. drawing out consequences. Expect reviewer number two to say the dumbest thing, or even like even both reviewers. Like they will raise dumb objections. They will raise irrelevancies. They will raise things that are utterly confused. Okay, that that's what they're going to do, and just expect it. That's part of the game. And if you get it, if you get a rejection on that, like again, like yeah, don't take it personally, mm -hmm. and just you know, just keep swimming. Right? It's that song. Just keep swimming. Just mm -hmm. keep swimming. Just keep swimming. So so you just gotta have to keep on swimming, right? Uh, you get knocked down, you get back up again. That's another song. So just got two song references. Um, yeah, just, just. You got to keep your just, head up. Yeah, you got to keep your head up. Oh, <laughs> okay. So you, you just got to keep your head up and keep going. Okay. Just put the reviewer, like I have had too many like fits of anger <laughs> because the second reviewer is so like, 
uh, you get so close to being published at a really good journal and the reviewer number two just raises a confused objection and it gets rejected. In general, there, there, there isn't an appeals process, right? So like, you're not going to be able to be like, but reviewer number two was so stupid. You know, like you're not going to be able to say that to an editor. Um, you just have to kind of take it. You know, yeah. this is a this is a rough and fierce game and you just have to keep going. You just have to keep going. Um, just see these putbacks, these put downs as an opportunity for growth. Right. Uh, they will help you gain some grit. You can it, it, going forward. Right. Address the objections, even the confused objections, because that next journal might send it to the same people. And yeah. they, they probably will. <laughs> and so address the objections that came up in the previous referee reports. Um, or like make clarifications early on that explicitly preempt those objections. Now you might still get them, right? Reviewers are that dumb, so you might still get them. <laughs> um, but but yeah, uh, that's that's the gist with the reviewers. Again, so expect expect idiocy. So forty percent of the time, roughly for me, forty percent of the time it's good. Uh, and I've had some like stellar referees. I mean, like stellar. They improve the paper. They're committed to helping you get this mm -hmm. published, and they are like really really good. Um, but that's that's the rare. Usually they're just decent. They're, they're average. They're good. That's like 40%. And then the, the other 60% is just crap. So, um, yeah, uh, that's what to expect. Yeah. I'll say that, um, really quick before we go on to the last thing about publishing a book, which you have more experience in than I do. Um, you know, I think the most charitable thing that you can do in response to some of these, like, you know, kind of more rough reviews is just kind of say at, at minimum, like there's a reason why they're saying what they are saying, even if yeah. it's wrong or mistaken. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, you want to take that into consideration, but there is that, at least for me, I, I'd say in my estimation, like that slim 10%, that's like, wait, no, there's there's nothing redeeming about this comment <laughs> yeah. at all. Yeah. You know? And so you got to be re ready for those types of things. But I think like, you got to be careful about making those judgment calls because then, you know, if you say that anyone who critiques your paper is just wrong, whatever, then you're going to be, you know, you don't want to be arrogant about this. But once you kind of get the feel for, you know, the field and you know kind of yourself more and, you know, the, the process, you can kind of, I think, more comfortably begin to say, I think that was a bad piece of advice, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And again, in general, like, like I said, I said, that, like, so, you know, some people right now who are listening are maybe thinking, well, Joe earlier said the reviewer is always right, but now you're saying that they're like 60% of the time, they're just stupid. <laughs> Joe Schmidt <So>, destroyed. <laughs> yeah, those are compatible with one another. Okay, what I mean is that <clears throat> be conciliatory. If they make a bad point, be like, um, that's a good point. That invites a clarification on yeah. this second premise. And I've detailed this clarification in this added footnote that I just add and direct them to that. Or I detail that clarification early on in the paper when I when I define this and I point out that it actually has this implication, which kind of circumvents um, the thing that you're pointing out. And I really thank you for bringing this because you've improved the paper. And you're know, like, thank them. Thank the referee in, in your response to the referees or things like that. Um, uh, yeah. So, so in general, yeah, take it as an opportunity for growth. And I mean, you know, sometimes it's because you weren't sufficiently clear or you weren't sufficiently precise or, you know, you were equivocating, you know, like things like that. So they do, like, it does give you an opportunity to at least make clarifications. So that's what I mean. Like the review is always right. Generally be conciliatory, say they, they're making good points and revise your paper in response to what they say. Um, and uh, also <clears throat> you can make your paper more modest than you really think. So like sometimes the reviewer will give an objection and their objection will be like, well, if you take this certain view over here, then your argument just completely fails for that view because mm -hmm. it gets around it. And like, maybe you disagree with that, <clears throat> maybe. But like, if you don't want to like pick a bone and, you know, it's somewhat irrelevant to the paper, or, you know, it's kind of relevant, kind of not relevant. You could just say like in a footnote or something like, I admit that here's a way to get around the, get around the argument. I won't look at this further, but, um, you know, like, thanks to a referee for bringing that up. And uh, mm -hmm. for the sake of my argument, let's just treat it as an assumption that, that this view is false. And let's tease out the implications of that. Mm -hmm. So, like, sometimes you can just be more modest. And, you know, you might think right. inside, like, that view, firstly, is stupid. And secondly, uh, <laughs> and secondly, like, it doesn't even have the implication that the reviewer thinks it has. Um, so, yeah, sometimes it's called for to spell that out, but other times it's not. Just, like, be conciliatory. Like, yeah, um, you know, I just, I, I admit that admit that uh, that that is a way to get around the argument so you can be more modest than you really think and you know like i said again it's kind of a game uh and you're uh that's one way to play it uh and it's a good way to play it because yeah all right joe talk to us about how do you how you go about publishing a book well um so like <laughs> it's mainly the same process 
but you know the submission is kind of different right so it's mm -hmm. like you know you have to do like all the research and you have to do all the you have to do the outline take it chapter by chapter right you just treat each chapter as a paper and then at the end you kind of collect those together right mm -hmm. so it's basically like writing 12 papers or something and then collecting them together into a book and then what do you do well let me talk about my process uh so you know i'm reaching out to these different publishers and um so originally this is actually so. Originally, this was this was a lot different than it was. It was still existential and classical theistic proofs, but the chapters were different, formatting was different. The uh, you know there were there wasn't as much content, uh, and it was just a solo authored thing. And I was going to different publishers, and the thing that like the thing that always came up was, hmm. do you have a PhD? Yeah. No, yeah. no, I don't. I don't have a PhD. Uh, I could lie to you, but I'm not going to because yeah, yeah. you know <laughs> maybe Kant's right. Uh, so um. Yeah, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie. So uh, no, I'm sorry, Mr. or Mrs. Editor, I don't have a PhD. They respond back, sorry, we're not gonna we're not gonna look at your book. So yeah. I, that happened, maybe at like eight places that I went to, eight different publishing places. It was consistently, do you have a PhD? If not, we're not even gonna consider your book. Okay, so expect that. Um, thankfully, I just like didn't even, I just like said that I'm a philosopher at purdue or something that's like i said that i said something like that to springer and, and, and i also got on daniel linford and i mentioned that he has a phd and he got his phd he got you know he published and so like i mentioned that and i also said like i'm a philosopher at uh, purdue and i've published in these areas in these journals yeah. and so mm -hmm. like i just didn't mention it and the dude the, the editor didn't ask I mean, if he's watching this right now, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the book's gonna be revoked like tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> no yeah so um so yeah, I, we just I just didn't say anything, and he didn't ask. I'm guessing he just assumed, which okay. Um, I didn't say anything. I, I and you know he didn't ask, and he was like, "This sounds like an interesting project." You know, like I detailed it, and and so then the, you have to look. Usually, each of the websites for the the publishers have like a forum that you need to fill out. You like you have to do a lot of research for that forum. That's another thing mm -hmm. that I, I probably talk about. You have to talk about the the market and how it'll yeah. serve the market and you have to talk about other competing books and whether they're recent and it's not good to say that there are no competing books why why is that not good think about that because that means there's no market for it right <laughs> so <laughs> if there are no competing books you're like oh this is this is an uh, this is not a competitor this is great no that is very bad uh, so like there need to be competing books you have to detail them explain how yours is different how yours will improve you have to talk about how it fits the publisher how it advances the field you have to talk about oh here's the rough structure of the book um you have to talk about all this stuff uh how are you going to promote it you have to talk about promotion like Mm -hmm. Man, like it's a really interesting process, but like you have to fill out these um these forums for each of the places that you're submitting it to, and you know sending it to the to the to the places. It's like the proposal forum. So yeah, usually that'll be on the publisher's website, and yeah, you fill that out. So I filled that out for Springer, and I sent it to him, and he thought it was really interesting. The editor, and he was like, "Yeah, let's well, let's go for it, and I'll send this out." So they sent it out to reviewers. He sent it out to I believe two anonymous reviewers. Well, I mean, I guess it could have been. So they do an internal review, review first. So they, they like mm -hmm. do their own editors. They look at the proposal. Um, sometimes you can send them their book, but it really just depends. If you have already written it, you can send the full book sometimes um, on the initial talk. Uh, but yeah, they do an internal review and they're like, yeah, we're going to send this out for review. So they do that. Um, and then mine, I think they sent out to two reviewers. We got the referee reports back. The referees in general were, they thought it was really good. So they gave us a few, a few suggestions. Um, but based on that, the, the, Springer editors were like, yeah, we'll, we'll go forward with this project and we'll give you a contract. And so that's, that's what they do. And then, yeah, you just sign the contract. And then again, you wait a long time because they have to format everything and so on. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's a different process. It's, it's a lot harder. <laughs> it's a lot harder uh, mm -hmm. than, cause it's like, yeah, it's like 12 articles basically. Uh, and also, you know, you have to do this whole proposal for me to go through all these third parties and talking to the editors and, it's a lot more waiting. Uh, it's you have to be so patient. You have to be very persistent. Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. uh, patience and persistence are like the, the two two biggest things. Um, but yeah, that that's basically that's basically how I went about publishing that one. Yeah, it's a much longer process, and you know you got to keep on top of things. I remember Eric Ybarra, uh, you know, a friend of mine who published his book on the papacy. He had to wait such a long time in order for the book to like be, you know, ready. And, 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 you know, that's not to knock on the publisher. That's just part of the, the reality of the, of the process. Thing. Yeah. Right. And also, I mean, his book was like o over a thousand pages, I think originally, and then he had to cut it down or something like that <laughs> to 700. 
um, something pages. And so, I mean, that's understandable. All right. Uh, well, with the time that we have left, Joe, do you mind if we take on some questions from the audience? Totally cool. So as you're as you're getting those up, I have to plug in my laptop. So I'll be back in like 15 seconds. All right. Sure thing. Sure thing. All right. So, yeah. And if you have any other questions for Joe, just like start sending them in or even for me, me and Joe, whatever, um, we'll be able to take them. Um, so let's see. Yeah. And I'll try to wrap up the stream, <clears throat> excuse me, in about maybe, you know, 10 minutes. I want to give you enough time to, you know, get all your thoughts out and to have Joe and I be able to give answers. All right, Joe, you ready for the first question? Uh, yes, indeed. Okay. So here's from um, Infinitame Zero. Must be pretty hard to ensure you have read all the relevant literature on the subject. Yeah. So I kind of two notes so you don't have to read all the relevant literature but it's like it's important to read like a a significant enough chunk of yeah. the research which is relevant to your topic um yeah it's difficult right this is this is a very difficult process uh i mean it, it varies by paper right so like one of my papers it was on um uh like explaining why the modal collapse argument doesn't work, but how that leads to maybe some other arguments that are at least more promising. Um, and I had to like, I had to cite so much from the free will literature. Oh. <laughs> and I, did, I had to oh, read, <laughs> I know. Yeah. And I had to read, oh man, it was, it was very rough. I had to read a lot, a lot of papers for that to cite. Um, but, but yeah, so like it, it depends. So like, but that paper, it's different from some other papers where it's like you have a new idea and it's like just in response to one argument that like only a few people are talking about right so like <laughs> you just have to cite maybe like three main things and engage with them and then and then develop your stuff so like it depends it, you know it just depends how much reading you're gonna have to do and how much research you're gonna have to do um and again like i said you don't have to do all the relevant literature it's just mm -hmm. like a significant enough chunk of it so as to like sufficiently engage with it it's it's difficult to tell this is why you get feedback from people who are in the field and who kind of have a no for this right it's like riding a bike you know it's like it's difficult to describe this stuff but after a while you get a sense and you're able to like help other people get a sense uh who are kind of new to it so um yeah that mm -hmm. that's that's the thing yeah i'd say for me like you know obviously you want to be like pretty well read in the area if you're going to write on it um because this isn't like a blog post where you can get away with a lot of things. No, this is like going to the experts and the people in the field. So I think the first thing you want to do is like know who the big names are, mm -hmm. right? And like cite them, right? Or at least like, you know, include them somehow in the paper if necessary. And then what the other thing I do for research, Joe, is I try to like have the reliable journals that I go to mm -hmm. kind of lined up already. So for example, if I'm writing a, a paper on, let's say, you know, biblical scholarship, I have Catholic Biblical Quarterly, I have all these other journals lined up and ready to go that I'll consult and see have these journals touched on the subject that I'm looking into. You know, you want to be um, smart about how you go about it, because obviously, if you try to read everything that's been written, that's going to be insane. <laughs> yeah, you're, gonna... you're never going to get that paper published, you know. And I mean, I think for the most part, like people understand, like, you know, not for the most part, I don't think anyone's going to be really offended if you don't mention them, like if they've written on the subject, because I mean, so many people have written something. But you want to make sure that at least you know you're you're keeping up and you're being responsible with it. Yeah. yeah. Um, Especially if it's like again, it needs to be like directly relevant to your paper. Like yeah. if someone published an objection to a premise two of your argument, yeah, and you do not talk about that objection, <laughs> yeah, that's a problem, right? But like you know, uh, if you're if you're talking about an argument and like as one of your you're just kind of flagging it as an assumption that you're assuming, let's say, a libertarian view of free will. You don't need to read all the literature there. Just be like, listen, I'm just assuming here a version of libertarianism. I'm not going to defend it. For mm -hmm. a seminal defense, you can just cite like one or two people. Right. And then for an overview of the literature, just see X. So then you can just cite like one or two things. Um, so like that's the sort of thing. Like just know which which are the which of the things it falls under, which of the um, whether it's directly relevant to like a central portion of your paper or whether or not it's one of these sorts of side things. Mm -hmm. And then just briefly, um, what really helps with this is or what really helps with getting a grip on what this relevant literature is, of course, yes, asking these other people who are your mentors of sorts, or at least people who are helping you. But also look at the papers that, you know, I gave you some some options like Google Scholar, uh, Phil Papers, mm -hmm. et cetera, SEP, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Look at these, and some of them give kind of like a broad view of the pre-existent literature. They're like, this person argued this, 
and then there were some responses here are those responses there were some counter responses and then it's kind of ripe for future research so like they might only have like 10 or so citations there and like if you just read those 10 like that could pretty i mean that could probably get you get you over the bar or get you over the line mm -hmm. yeah i mean yeah and part of part of the re, you know the research that you're doing and when you're responding and characterizing somebody's argument you know you have an obligation and to some extent right to stay up to date because let's say the person has recently published a paper right before you submit your paper you can't in good conscience then you know send your paper to the publisher for or for the editor for consideration when they have just published something new and it's within your proximity to look at it and see how that affects the paper even if it's inconvenient for you in the process exactly yeah exactly so like that will often be a reason for rejection of papers yeah. um, someone mm -hmm. will overlook it, they overlook relevant literature. That is a huge, so like that's that's a very good criticism from a referee if they can show that, uh, yeah, you have overlooked relevant literature. That is a very good substantive problem for papers and a reason why you might get a rejection. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely just beware of that. All right, this is a question from, uh, let's see, Alethea, how do you know if a topic has been thoroughly written on? How do you determine if an idea has already been put out there? Really good questions. The the simple answer, and of course it's more complex than the simple answer lets on, but the simple answer is that research stage that we talked about earlier on, that's gonna that's gonna be the key, right? So like you're doing your research, you're looking up keywords, uh, you're looking up um, so let's just say you're interested in modal collapse, right? What you're doing, the modal collapse argument against divine simplicity or something, what you then need to do is you need to go on like Google Scholar, you need to go on uh, Phil Papers, you need to go on um, uh, JSTOR, you need to go on these sorts of things and look up keywords, look up modal collapse, search it, and then yeah. it'll give you some papers. Look up divine simplicity, search it. Look up, uh, go to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy entry on divine simplicity. Like, look up, look up key terms, right, and see if, like, the topic has been written on, and that'll give you a good sense. Um, you all, you can also ask um, professionals in the field, like, hey, are you aware of this? Or like, like, it's not going to be a good idea. So philosophers are hyper specialized. Okay, so that means they focus on like one topic, or a few topics, usually in a few few different areas, a few topics in a few different areas, but they like hyper focus on those and they, they take them to town, and they, they research a ton of them, right. So like, if you're asking me about, for instance, um, let's say, Pascal's wager. Like, I don't research that. Okay. So like, mm -hmm. I can point you to some of Liz Jackson's papers and things yeah. like that. But like, I'm not in that. Like, I don't like, even though I'm in philosophy of religion, and that falls in philosophy of religion, right? So someone, you might think you can go up to a philosophy of religion and ask them about a topic. But like, they're gonna, they're gonna mainly be able to help you with their particular specialty, right? So try to find the people who have the specialty, right? So if someone specializes on Pascal's wager, like Liz Jackson, ask her about uh, the relevant research that you should be looking at, <clears throat> that you should be looking at. Uh, don't ask someone who's like an expert on ontological arguments. What, like, hey, mm -hmm. what, what should I do with Pascal's wager? Like, so again, it's important to not only go to professionals in the field, but professionals in the field who are specialists on the topic, or at least related topics. They will help you see whether or not this has been thoroughly written on and whether or not the idea has already been put out there. So the two main things is ask other people who are in the field. Uh, and secondly is do the search of the key terms. Find that out in your research stage. Eli Whaley asks, have you ever dealt with imposter syndrome? Are there constructive ways to overcome it? Yeah, so I, so some people in the audience uh, might not be aware of what imposter syndrome is. So as I understand it, uh, imposter syndrome is when like you're in an environment, maybe it's a new school, maybe it's uh, around people who are publishing, and you're like there, but you like feel like you don't really belong there. You feel like an imposter of sorts. Um, you just you don't really feel up to task with the other people there. You're like, why am I here? Why I, I don't I, you feel like you don't belong there, even though you're like you're there. You got into the school, you know. Um, so I, that's kind of is that is that how you understand it as well? Yeah, basically, you know, I, I, and you just feel like you're not qualified. Yeah, you know, yeah. in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, I mean, occasionally I've dealt with that. Yeah, but um, I guess the way to get around it is just to. I mean, firstly, so there, there are two things. One of them is the, the, an elevating strategy, and another one is the de-elevating strategy, okay? <laughs> the elevating strategy is to say, listen, like, to, just to give yourself these kind of reminders, factual reminders, mind you, they have to be factual, but factual reminders. Joe, you applied to this place. 
you put in so much hard work for this. You deserve to be at this school. You know, like if it's an imposter syndrome with respect to a school. So like you put in the hard work. They looked at your application. They said you're good here. So you're there. Like you deserve to be there, right? You put in the hard work. Um, so like for me, it's this is again, this is the elevating strategy. It's elevating you up. Um, and yeah, like I, I try to tell myself like, Joe, like you've published, you've talked about these things. You've published a book, you published papers. So like, you know, you belong to be here along with the rest of the philosophical community, right? It's not like, uh, you know, so like that, that's one way. It's the elevating strategy. The de-elevating strategy is just to recognize like, yeah, uh, I'm new to this, right? I need to have the requisite humility. I need to have the requisite epistemic humility. I need to have moral humility. I need to recognize that I'm not all that, right? That I'm not the, like, the best thing on the block or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. I am just this puny human being who is trying their best to get around in the world. And, um, you know, I'll try my hardest, but uh, I recognize that, you know, I have so much room to improve, right? It's that mm -hmm. growth mindset. I have so much room to improve. And so keeping that humility, keeping that like ep epistemic humility with respect to like the confidence, your beliefs and what you know, recognize the limitations of your perspective of the research that you've done. So recognizing your limitations, owning them um, and a commitment to grow, a commitment to learn and uh, a commitment also to be kind of morally humble as well. So um, both the elevating strategy and the de-elevating strategy together, when you combine them, make mm -hmm. for a great mix, a great pot that can help you beat imposter syndrome. One of them is elevating you up. You do belong to be here. And the other one is not letting you go too high up and is keeping you grounded and it's keeping you to have these intellectual and moral virtues. Yeah. And I mean, like, it's really important that you don't just have one or the other, because if you just have the de-elevating strategy, you're just going to dunk on yourself all the time. <laughs> yeah. and you actually have a good point. But with the elevating strategy, you can end up not being forgiving of yourself when you do make mistakes, right? And then you just beat yourself up constantly because you're like, no, I was supposed to be this, you know, really smart giga chad and here I am struggling. <laughs> and it's like, no, 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 no. There, there's a nuance here. There, uh, you know, golden mean between the two of them. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I mean, just briefly before we go on the next question. Um, yeah, you can also not just like be unforgiving toward yourself, but you can be, you can start to be resistant to growth, right? So you kind of harden, mm -hmm. you kind of, um, What's the word? Calcitize. I think that's the word. Man, mm -hmm. that would have been such a good uh, adjective or whatever to use. <laughs> but the, I think it's called calcitize. Um, you know, when like bones, like or certain things that are not bone, they start to become like really hard, like bone or whatever. So yeah, you can you can start to like be resistant to growth if you get in that kind of mindset. So you need both of those strategies: the elevation strategy and the de-elevation strategy. All right, um, Alethea has another question. How much did Daniel Linford contribute to the book? This is uh, for Joe. Yeah, so he contributed uh, a lot on the stuff in there in relativity. He contributed a lot on um, updating the existential inertia literature in light of relativity. He added certain objections and different, um, uh, you know, like the classical theistic proofs stuff. Um, he helped with uh, the formulations of the existential inertia theses. So his hands were in basically every single chapter. Um, both of our hands were in every single chapter. There are certain chapters where, you know, like I wrote most of it. There are other uh, chapters where, you know, like, or at least at least major sections where he wrote almost all of it or all of it. Uh, he helped on the stuff on causal simultaneity. So it's actually really difficult to say how much he contributed to the book. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think that's what I'll say. All right. Uh, Alethea asked the question as well. How do you find your niche? How do you know it is a niche? How You said you were lucky in finding the topic of existential inertia before. Yeah. So, so let me say something on that. So remember at the the pre-writing stage i think we called it um we, we had the idea right that that's, yeah. that was like mm -hmm. the first thing we started with it's very helpful uh if your idea is on is on something which has a manageable literature behind it is cutting edge and is significant i kind of got lucky with existential inertia there like i could count the papers published on that on like one hand when i started mm -hmm. uh, when i started off on this uh started researching that so it was a very manageable literature. Another thing about it was it's very significant. It has to do with, uh, you know, arguments for God's existence. And, you know, it's like a, it has to do with metaphysics. So it intersects a bunch of different fields. And it's also cutting edge. Like the papers that were being published, like they were starting to, you know, the, the literature was starting to snowball. They were starting to, you know, build up. So I did get kind of lucky in that. Um, so you do have to kind of find your, your niche. Uh, and I found one there. I have other topics that I research on, like right now, almost like, 
a lot of papers that are, of mine under review are on like infinity and uh, infinity paradoxes and causation and Patrick principles and modality and things like that. Um, but uh, but how do you find a niche? Uh, I don't know. You stumble upon it. You, you look at your interests. You look at what you're good at. You look at when you're reading papers, what captivates you. Um, like I said, go to like journals and read recent issues, you know, like that's giving you a glimpse into like what's some cutting edge research in the topics that I'm interested in. So like I said, go to like religious studies, look at some of the recent papers that have been published there, like scroll through their recent issues the past year or two. Same with uh, IJPR, same with EJPR, like European Journal of Philosophy Religion, etc. So um, yeah, I guess it, uh, let, me, let me pull up something because I actually took notes from like, I was listening to a, a lecture the other day and it was on good work. So apparently there's been psychological research on good work. Are you going to share work. your screen? Oh, no, no, no. It, it's, it's really okay. short. Um, good work combines what we're good at. So our excellence, what we're passionate about. So that's like engagement, something that we're engaged with. And thirdly, what we value, like our ethics. So three E's. Mm -hmm. Good work combines excellence, engagement, and ethics. We're good at it. It engages us. And it meshes well with our values and our ethics. So that's a that's a tip how you can try to find uh, your niche. Um, it's something that let's say you are you know like you have ideas on it, you've thought about it. So that's kind of your excellence there. Um, you have a publishable idea ish. Uh, you're you're passionate about it. You're engaged on it. You're interested in it, right? So like when you read papers, like this is stuff that you're interested in, and it meshes well with what you value. Like like yeah, I mean that one's kind of like if you're interested in philosophy, pretty much like if it's a philosophical topic, it's probably going to mesh with your ethics, but. Um, so yeah, I guess those three E's, as well as just finding stuff that's like reasonably new and uh, reasonably cutting edge, it's difficult. And there's some luck involved and there's chance involved and yeah. Okay, I'll take uh, this last question. And then there are some fun comments that I would be um, you know, remiss if I didn't mention. So Alethe asked once again, Swan, where are you with the papacy book? I know you are starting it. So yeah, I mean, um, there have been multiple times in the past where I said, like, I wanted to write a book on the papacy, but then I just got kind of cold feet and I didn't feel like I was ready yet. And then more recently, in light of like the new kind of, you know, the four hour lecture that I did, all the research I went into that, you know, my time with the Dominicans and taking a break and then with the, you know, Cameron's conversion and me sitting down now, give it, getting ready to give the updated new stuff with the argument, I was able to like make a lot of pieces click together. Like I was able to come up with an exegetical framework for interpreting typology. And now my research has taken me into the book of Acts and not just, you know, Matthew and Isaiah, but it's now it's expanding really into a biblical theology of Peter. And I think I'm ready now to really sit down and put the work on this. And so, you know, I have a basic kind of proposal ready and I have someone who's kind of helping me get all this ready, but you know, you, you know, you, I'm hoping that I could get a manuscript finished in like five and a half months for everything that I want to do with this book. So we'll see what happens. Um, you know, so Joe, once again, people are mentioning that you look like Tom Holland and Spider-Man. And I don't know. Do you ever get tired of that, Joe? Honestly, I, I kind of don't. I kind of think it's funny because like I can see the resemblance, et cetera. Um, I mean, sometimes, I mean, sometimes like people on my videos, like on my, like, Everyone has said this for years. And so sometimes I get a comment. It's like, did you know that you look like it's like, yes, of course, I know that. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> so like when they say, did you know? I'm like, OK, that's kind of annoying. But if they just point it out, that's fine with me. I think it's kind of fun and funny. Whenever whenever I see new comments on it and I'm in a playful mood, I'm just like, that's because I am Tom Hollander. You know, I say things right. like that. Let's see. Um, let's, OK, Guarded Acumen has this funny comment. Joe, when will you start defending the truth of presentism? Abandon your eternalist sympathies. Hey, I'm agnostic on the matter. So I have sympathies in some sense of both <laughs> presentism and eternalism. So uh, yeah, I, I used to be uh, I used to be a lukewarm presentist, uh, and I used to call myself that. But ah, man, general and special relativity, and uh, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's all very difficult. And uh, there are reasonable considerations on both sides. So honestly, I kind of don't know. But uh, <laughs> I know uh, Guarded Acumen is a diehard presentist. So. Mm -hmm. All right, Joe, actually, sorry, I wanted to get just one more question, and here it is. Um, would Joe essentially give the same advice for writing slash publishing a book as a paper? You can kind of give a summary, because we touched on that a little bit. And also, any advice for people not in school who would like to publish? Yeah, so I mean, I'd give the same advice for the idea for the book and for the, the writing process and for the research. Um, you could treat the book as basically 
12 separate papers. Or, you know, I say 12. I mean, that's because I think that's the number of chapters that I had. But, you know, whatever number of chapters between maybe, what, 5 and 15 or something, however many chapters you have, think about that as, like, 5 to 15 papers that you're going to write. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it's basically, like, the same thing, uh, each of those. But, of course, you know, you have to sort of thematically unify them, thematically tie them, and have relevant transitions and interbook references or whatever. Um, so it's basically the same thing. And then, yeah, as, as for publishing it, uh, it's slightly different. You have to have a book proposal. You have to talk about the market. You have to talk about how you're going to promote it. You have to talk about, at least at least for a lot of, lot of proposals. Um, yeah. Whereas with a paper, you kind of just do that in the intro. You sometimes say like, oh, this is, you know, this touches on these other people who've recently written stuff. But like, you have to spell that out a lot in a proposal. Mm -hmm. You have to be very explicit. And then it's going to be much longer for publishing a book. Uh, the process is much longer. There, are, There's a lot more uh, bureaucratic hurdles. Um, uh, if you don't have a PhD, it's going to be very difficult. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, there are ways, you know, like if you have other people who are kind of associated with an academic press or, you know, people who are in the know and they can like vouch for you, like that exactly. can help, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, it's still going to be, you know, it's still going to be difficult without a PhD, but you can do it, evidently. Uh, and then any advice for people not in school who would like to publish? So it kind of depends where you are. Um, so like when, when you're writing these papers, one thing that I forgot to mention is that you have to have, uh, usually it's in like a uh, title page. It's not a big deal, but you just put the title, you put the abstract in there. I mean, you have the title and the abstract in your paper, but they also want it separately in a page. So you put like the title, the abstract, the keywords, um, mm -hmm. usually declarations. So what you just say there is like, there are no conflicts of interest. I don't have any funding. <laughs> you just say so, you say things like that. This is in your title page, it's usually only one page. Um, mm -hmm. You also need an, oh, oh, I forgot to mention this. Now I'm embarrassed. You have to, have, to publish generally. Not always, but generally, it's advised that you have an ORC ID. So, or I think some people say it's an ORCID or something. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but an ORC ID is like a unique researcher identification number. It's kind of like your student number, you know, when you're like at a university. Um, but it's like it's your profile as as your as a researcher, and it's basically a, a network that all the researchers are on, and it, like it, it associates your papers with you, and it like. The database has your like email in it and so on. So you just go in order to get that, it's free, right? You just go to orcid.org or whatever or ORCID, and it's like a 16-letter thing. And yeah, you also have to include that in your title page. That's sometimes required for journals. Um, it's very again, like I said, it's free. It's easy to set up. Um, and then you also have to have uh, your institutional affiliation. That's the reason why I brought this up. So um, that usually doesn't matter, right? It's not like like in general like this publishing process is totally anonymized. Like your, your name is not on this stuff. That's why you have a separate page with all that. And usually like the editors who are making decision on your paper don't know your identification. They don't know whether or not you're associated with an institution. It removes a lot of bias. So um, it doesn't really matter that you're not associated, like that you're not at a school and that you can't say like Purdue University on your thing, right? It doesn't really matter. But like when you're writing that title page, you want to say something like, independent researcher, you know, something mm -hmm. like that, like you're not associated, affiliated with an institution. Um, but other than that, I mean, my advice is basically the same as sort of what I've, what I've um, been going through. Um, uh, now, I guess it might be difficult to uh, make connections with, like I said, professors earlier, you know, like professors are the people who are going to be like reading your papers potentially, or like grad students. So what should you do if you're not at a university? I mean, sometimes you can like email a professor and say, hey, I'm really interested in your work and I kind of want to get into publishing. Would you be able to read this paper? Now, sometimes if you're having trouble and people and professors are, and I should have said this earlier as well, if you're having trouble and professors are like, no one's wanting to read your paper, just like give them a section, right? Say, mm -hmm. hey, this is only one page long and I'd love for your feedback on this section or like it's two pages long. Um, so you can like ask for feedback on sections, right? Things like that. So that's another idea. Um, but yeah, just email people, right? That they're they're very willing to help. I mean, again, like don't email Swinburne and ask him to like ask him to like read your paper and give feedback. Yeah. Like that's a bit out there. Um, but uh, but like, hey, uh, you know, you maybe you talk to people in the Reason and Religion Facebook group, and you know, there are some professional philosophers in there, and there are some other people who are grad students who are just finishing up a grad school. Like, send them an e send them a message. They're like, hey, I've got this paper. Would you be able to help? Or you know, things like that. Um, but yeah. All right. Well, Joe, that's all the questions I have for you tonight. And I think that's all the audience has for tonight. Um, Joe, I mean, I know that you have your, what is it, your blog, Majesty of Reason, your YouTube channel by the same name. 
academia page? Where else can we find you? Is, or did I cover all the bases? Yeah, well, I mean, I have this website, which is kind of like a hub for everything. It's like, I think it's uh, josephschmid.com. Uh, so, I mean, people can go there and that has my papers and so on. Um, my Phil Papers profile, that's like the it's like the philosopher's tinder of sorts <laughs> basically <laughs> so like uh it just has publications on there um and so yeah people can check that out but the main thing i guess is the youtube channel that's what i'm uh that's where i'm mainly located all right well joe it was great having you on the show and i'm always happy to see you and i hope you're doing well yeah this was wonderful thanks again salon and i hope the audience could benefit from this